Well, good evening. We're in Psalm chapter 73 tonight, and uh, we're looking at a godly man who seemed to be plagued with doubt. And uh, sometimes that's a real problem. It's uh, Doubt is uh, can be very painful, just like something wrong with the body. Uh, it's, it's trying to live the Christian life, uh, like someone would be driving an automobile with the brakes on. And, and so we have to deal with it and deconstruct doubt and see what the real issue is. And we'll see here in this psalm what the uh, psalmist is struggling with. So beginning in verse number one, truly God is good to Israel. Now that's a, that's a statement of faith and most everybody would nod in agreement. But I want to suggest to you, for some, that's just a superficial statement. It's sort of like a Sunday school answer without much depth. And then not everybody would agree that God is good to them, especially if they're going through some difficult uh, circumstances in life. Uh, but that's a basic attitude that we want to affirm that God is good. And of course, what the writer is uh, assuming and affirming is that God's actions have been good to Israel. But there's almost an implication here. He has not been good to me because what we're going to see in the psalm is that the writer is uh, going through some painful suffering and uh, his life is not uh, not going well and it doesn't look good and he thinks it doesn't really pay to be righteous. And so there's this struggle going on and it causes some real problems as we will see here in just a moment. Truly God is good to Israel and that's, that's, that's absolutely true. Even to such with a clean heart or, or a pure heart, that is the people who are really sincere. And we must be sincere. We must be genuine about our faith in him. But has for me, do you see that? But has for me, my, my feet have almost slipped or they almost have gone and have well slipped. Now, I want you to think about what he's trying to say here. I don't want you to uh, imagine someone just tripping over the sidewalk or over some obstacle on the floor. The, the image would be more like a, a, a mountain climber on the face of a cliff and uh, his foot slips and the, and the, the, the uh, tragedy would be that if he did slip, it would be a fatal flaw. And so what he's really saying, I've almost stumbled. I almost have fallen almost in a fatal or tragic way. Then in verse number three, you see the problem here. I was envious, he said, at the foolish. Now, let me just stop here for a moment. And uh, when we talk about envy, it's usually we're envious of what someone has and we don't have. And uh, if it's about people that have money, then the rich are the target. Or if it's about popularity, then someone you see who's at the top of the ladder is the target. So envy usually has a target that it's pointing to. And when he considers the rich, it looks like uh, they're living a charm life and that things are going well and, and things are not going well for him. So he'll say in verse number three, for I was envious at the arrogant or the uh, people who uh, uh, have a charm life, who are, who are living the good life, he says. And he, in the King James, it says, foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, I want you to see a contrast here for just a moment. He's living a righteous life. He's a godly man. And he's talking about, I've almost slipped because it does not seem that life is going well for me. Or we might say, God hasn't been good to me. I, I'm going through suffering. I'm going going through pain. Uh, the, I'm going through all kinds of struggles. And yet here's the guy who is the wicked and it looks like he's just having a, having a great life. And so he'll say in verse number four, uh, and he begins to describe uh, the wicked people by saying, 
for there are no uh, uh, bands in their depth. Now, we just talked they're prosperous, and we'll see why they're prosperous, because they're wicked, and they take advantage of people, and uh, they're corrupt, and they do things that are underhanded, and uh, they cheat, and they lie, and they steal, and they oppress the poor. And the next thing he talks about here is that they, they, uh, they have no pain in their death. I mean, good night. I mean, they just go through life and then they, they slip out of this world uh, without any agony or pain in their death. But their strength is firm, he says. And it's interesting, sometimes, you know, people without God, they'll die without any fear of God. Uh, they're not look. they don't expect anything else. And uh, he's talking about here are these people who live such, uh, such a wicked life. They ignored God in life. They didn't take God into account. They don't think God has anything to do with them. And so they're living that kind of life. And it looks like on the surface that everything is just going uh, really well for them. But I want you to think about something. Not everything is how it appears to be. Now, notice in verse number uh, five, they are not in trouble as other men. That seems like they're free from trouble. And uh, neither are they plagued like other men. Verse number six, he talks about their arrogance and pride is right in your face. That's what he means when he says their pride compass them about has a necklace. I mean, and then he'll go on to say their violence covers them has a garment. I mean, they're they're pompous, they're they're boastful. Uh, they 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 like to, for people to to see that. And then he goes on to say about their violence, and of course, violence was just a way for them to get to the top of the ladder as far as this world was concerned. And so they, the violence covered them has a garment, he says, and then he talks about their eyes are like, uh, <laughs> like fat eyes. And what he just simply means is he's talking about their greed, and it seems like their heart, he goes on to say, in the rest of this verse is sort of like without limits. They're so covetous and greedy, and uh, yet they prosper in that uh, vein. Notice verse number eight. They are corrupt and they speak wickedly concerning uh, concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They're just proud and arrogant and, uh, uh, you know, that's just how they are. Then in verse number nine, their mouth speaks against heaven. I ought to stop there for just a moment. Uh, of course, they don't think they have any need for God, but they defy God. They speak against God. And it's, it's an amazing how I wonder sometimes why people do that. And it comes basically fundamentally down to, to people, just people like that are evil. I mean, they're just evil where they would curse God, speak against God, try to get rid of God. And that's just evil. And we don't like to call it that sometimes. Now, notice here in verse number uh, 10, therefore, the people. Now, he's referring to the influence of the wicked. It, it, it seems like by being wicked and corrupt and crooked that you prosper in life. And that influences people, he said. Therefore, the people turn to them and the water of the full cup are, are draining them out. It seems like there's a twofold idea here. Because they, people see how to get ahead and, and to be underhanded and to be manipulative and how to go over the top of somebody else on the job, uh, they see how that works. And uh, then on the other hand, when you step over the righteous, you see, it's like wringing them out, draining them out and bringing sorrow in their hearts. Now note verse number 11. And they say, how does God know? And there's no knowledge in the most high. They don't believe, you see, that God intervenes or interferes in any sense of the word. And he, it seems like uh, they're getting away with whatever they're getting away with. And uh, God doesn't seem to, to care or doesn't seem to act. And so he says in verse number 12, behold, these are the ungodly. They prosper in the world and they increase or enriches or amass fortune. Now that's the first part of, of the song. It just looks like people without God, people ignore God and people who are even evil and wicked prosper in the world. But I just want you to keep remembering something and not everything appears <laughs> like you think it does. All right, now verse number 13. Now, 
the effect upon him. Verily, now this is in contrast, of course, to the wicked. And, and of course, he's a righteous man. And so he says, verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. What good was it to, to live a good life, to be righteous, trying to please God? And I washed my hands in innocence. I've done everything right. I've been doing what God wants me to do. And nevertheless, I have suffered. Now, I want you to think about it in this way. Uh, you, you might know somebody that does everything right regarding their health. They eat right, they exercise, uh, they don't smoke, they don't chew, and they don't drink. And, uh, you know, they really take care of themselves. They take a bucket of, uh, of vitamins. I mean, they're very earnest. They do everything right. And yet, time after time, they're either in the hospital, something's wrong, uh, something is always happening to them, and yet they're doing their best to do what they can do. And then there's this other guy. Here's a guy that doesn't eat right, you know, and uh, he doesn't exercise, and he he do, he eats the wrong stuff, and uh, yet, you know, he'll live to be 99 and die in, <laughs> if you want to call it in health. So, so this is what the psalmist is saying here. I've been doing everything right. I've been living the way God wants me to, and I'm not prospering. Those wicked folks prosper, but I'm not prospering. Everything for me is just going right down the drain. And so he says, all this has been in vain. I washed my hands and in it to see, and I cleansed my heart, you see. And, and I'm, I'm, I just want you to consider that because how, how that might affect some folks there. Notice verse number 14, for all the day long, think about that phrase, all the day long, I have been played and chastised every morning. I mean, day after today, week after way, uh, week after week. It just does not seem like it's ever, ever ending. And so he's going through some kind of severe illness and he's struggling with that. Not only is he struggling with that emotionally, that is physically, but he's just struggling mentally with this whole business. How is it as he thinks about this, it causes him pain to even think about it. I'm doing everything right and everything is wrong. These people are doing everything wrong, and it seems like everything's going right for them. Now notice verse number 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, he doesn't want to say anything. How come he doesn't want to say anything? Behold, I would offend the generation of thy children. In other words, it would be offensive to them they, they to speak for for a godly man or a man of God, a man in the church to speak like that. It would have seemed like treachery, and it would have been offensive, and it also would have had a tremendous ill effect. And so he kept quiet. But it's a struggle. It's a, he's really he's really having a problem with this. And if anybody's going through adversity and they're going through pain and illness and and it just goes on forever, and then you look down the street and here's a guy that doesn't care about God one iota and life is just going as smooth as silk for him. Then notice verse sixteen. When I thought of to know this, it was too painful for me. And so, so I want you to see this isn't some light matter for him. He's trying to figure it out, and 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 because he's really struggling with it, he mentions as we start started earlier that I almost fell. I almost gave it up. I almost threw the towel in. I almost, I almost slipped away from God. Now. Verse 17, until, now notice here, here's the turning point, and, I, and this is a very important verse, especially, uh, especially some folks really need to hear this, because I've been talking a lot about this, uh, if you've been listening at all. Until I went to the assembly, the, the sanctuary of God, that's, that's the assembly. Uh, we would say today, but when I went to church and I heard gospel preaching and I was surrounded by the fellowship of godly people who aspired to please God, when I was able to go there and be surrounded by a community of faith, when I was there, now when you're not there, you're not surrounded by that. And when you're not feeding yourself with the things of God, you are going to be influenced by a community of unbelievers. But he says, everything changed when I went to church using 
that loosely. When I went to the assembly, see, when you go to the assembly, you're encouraged and you're admonished and you get to reflect upon eternal perspectives. Uh, life is more than this life. And that's what he's going to talk about because now he's going to talk about the whole outcome of this whole business. Now notice in verse numbers again, when I understood their end. Now that's important, isn't it? I mean, everything ends and the end really matters. In fact, the proverb writer will say the end is better than the beginning. It's important how uh, how life ends and, and what the outcome of life is. And so it may be that they're prospering in life, but there's more to life and life doesn't end here uh, in the grave. And that's what you're going to see. In fact, this psalmist will bring up a point that there is something to look forward after death. And he's going to say that death doesn't rob God of the man of God. Now watch it here. Surely, now he talks about them. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou cast them down to destruction. So it doesn't end well with them. And you see, church will make you think about how things end. It'll think you about when life is over. It'll think about what's really important. It, 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 it will give you what you ought to really value, what is really significant in life. Now, you're not going to get that in the college uh, campuses. You're not going to get that in the study hall. You're not going to, nobody's going to be talking about that down the street or at McDonald's. Uh, you, you're going to find that message, at least if someone's preaching the gospel, that there are things that we need to look forward to be careful about. Now, here again, he'll say this, surely, verse number 19, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? Tell you what, things change around pretty quick then, don't they? Now, verse 20 he talks about a dream, you know, and I thought about a number of different things here, but really a dream is sort of a brief thing, it, but a dream may seem real. <laughs> I think that that's what, you know, you hear people all the time talking about living the dream, and they mean they're driving a nice car, living in a nice house, uh, things are going well for them, but you know, those kind of dreams end. And that's what he's talking about here. They're brief, awaketh, O Lord, when thou awaketh, despise their shadow. That's all it is. Then verse number 21. Thus my heart was grieved. Now here, here's what's going on. You see, when the man of God gets in the right direction and he's got good gospel preaching and he's surrounded by good people that believe the same thing, uh, then, you know, when he begins to really look through it. Now, can I let me stop here for just a moment? The underlying cause of his doubt is really uh, not an intellectual. What it was was envy. And the reason he was envy because he was living, in some ways we would say an unfortunate life while others were living what we might say the good life. And when he really starts to reflect upon that, here's what he meant by this. Here's what he's saying, uh, that uh, my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. It had that kind of effect upon them. Because now, you know, let me read it here. You'll, you'll see the flow of this. So I was stupid. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I, was, I was ignorant. I was foolish. I was like a beast. An idea here, like a beast. I wasn't really thinking through this when I was suffering. When I was in those dark places, I was like a beast without any sense at all. Uh, you know, I, I just wasn't uh, uh, getting a good grip on what was really, really going on there. But then once you see the gospel and the, God's word, uh, he begins to reflect, you see. And even though he was in that awful place, you see, on his reflection and being back in the sanctuary and, and seeing the perspective of what really, really matters and being a God person was so significant, then he thinks about how was I so stupid to think anything different. Now, uh, he'll go on to say in verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by the right hand. Now, I, I want you to think here uh, because uh, I want to say a couple of things. Number one is sometimes, and this is going to sound maybe on the surface a little paradoxical, but sometimes when we think God is absent, he's the closest to us. Uh, did you get that? And the reason here is that he was with God is because God never left him. That's what he means here. He said, God, he says here that uh, God was holding me by the right hand. God didn't let him slip. And even though, and, and let me just say this, you may be in that kind of place. And uh, 
don't you ever forget that God is with you then. He's just not good with you when you're on the mountaintop. Now watch it here. Thou has guided me with thy counsel afterwards. Now afterwards what? After death? And sometimes people don't believe uh, the Old Testament has anything to say about this. Surely it does. In fact, one time Jesus said to the Sadducees that didn't believe in afterlife and the resurrection, he said, have you not read? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not was, but is. They're alive. Now, here you go. So nevertheless, so in uh, verse, uh, what is it? Verse uh, 25 again. Well, no, verse yeah, verse 20, after, no, verse 24, after receive me to glory. How about that? After I die, receive me to glory. You know, the Bible says when a man dies, that spirit that God gives him returns to him. Mm -hmm. It does. Now, verse 25, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on the earth that I desire but thee. Nothing. Can you? I want to say this very slowly. There is absolutely nothing that takes the place of God. I don't care if you're living in Disney World, basking on the beach, uh, on, uh, going to the Bahamas, uh, you know, you're on tour, uh, all that junk, you know. Nothing, absolutely nothing takes the place of God. That's why we got to get it right. Now notice here. Uh, my flesh and my heart faileth. When is that? At death. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion is forever. Let me say this, death cannot rob God of the man of God. Don't you forget that. Now, for lo, they are far from thee, and uh, they shall perish, that is, the ungodly, and thou hast destroyed all of them that go whoring from thee. That's King James. But it's good for me to draw, where, draw where, at the assembly? Boy, people need to learn that. Even some people who are Christians need to learn that. It is good, and there's reasons that it's good. I won't go into all of that now, but there are reasons. There are reasons why it is good to draw near to God. And what he's been talking about, that was at the sanctuary. I have put my trust in the Lord God. I will declare all his word. What a powerful, powerful psalm. And I hope that you'll reflect upon some of the things that we talked about tonight. And uh, because make God first in your life. Nothing takes the place of God. And you need to be in the community of believers who support you, encourage you, and uh, stir you up to do the kind of things that God wants you to do. So I'm glad you're with me tonight. We'll be continuing our study in the Psalms. We're already going to be in Psalm 75. That means we're halfway through. So I'll see you tomorrow at noontime.